Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Staten. I'm a soybean educator with MSU Extension. I want to welcome you to this May 11th version of the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. It's my pleasure now to introduce our, our one of our presenters for this morning, uh, Dr. Kurt Steinke. Uh, Dr. Steinke is Associate Professor um, in MSU Soil Fertility and Nutrient Management, and today's topic is soybeans and nitrogen applications. Kurt, take it away. Thank you. Uh, all right. Hope everyone's off to a good uh, morning here today. I'm sure everyone's chomping at the bit. It looks like planning is finally in uh, full swing uh, across bulk of the state. And uh, hopefully, Jeff, will have a good weather forecast that it will keep uh, planting moving as we move forward through the end of the week and next week. So uh, what we wanted to share a little bit about today, I thought it was quite timely, is talk about soybeans and nitrogen applications. Now, one of the big things is why soybeans and why nitrogen? Um, some of us know some of these reasons, some of us do not. A um, Couple of background pieces of information. Yes, we know yields have increased, not quite as much probably in soybeans as we've seen in, in something like corn and wheat, but we know some of the reasons for this include uh, some environmental issues, uh, genetics, absolutely, and variety selection, and a better job at management. You know, we can apply just about any nutrient across the board uh, at any point of the growing season in any way, shape, or form. Um, one of the other differences in soybean today versus maybe, oh, a decade or two ago is greater dry matter production. And so, you know, I, I always ask the question, what drives nutrient uptake? It's dry matter. And so without a doubt, you can see um, soybean biomass, um, maybe five, six foot tall soybeans in some cases is a little bit more common today than it used to be. And as you produce more biomass, you accumulate more nutrients, which brings us back to the question of yield gaps. So we know we have discovered yield gaps. Oftentimes, if you wanna cite a threshold number, you know, once we hit about that 70 bushel to the acre mark, that's when we start consider uh, some of those soy acres to be high yield. And in some cases, the question becomes, can that plant provide enough nitrogen for itself at some of those higher yield potentials? And that's a little bit of what we want to go over here today. When you look at statistics, I think uh, the, the nearest one I could find is about 2018, about half of Michigan soybean acres receive some form of nitrogen. So about 50%. Now that's the statistics a little bit skewed because if you apply phosphorus to your soybeans, most of that phosphorus is gonna come with nitrogen and that can count uh, in that category also. So do soybeans require N? Absolutely. So if you start looking at how much and when, it becomes about five pounds of N per bushel of uptake. And so if you look at maybe a 60 bushel soybean crop, you're looking at around 300 pounds of N in uptake and about 3.3 pounds of that will be removed with the grain. So you start thinking about it, do those numbers, that's quite a bit of nitrogen. When you compare that to corn, you look at maybe 200 bushel corn, you'll probably uptake and remove, you know, about 180, 185 units of N. So without a doubt, soybean is above that threshold. You know, an interesting fact is if you go in and soil sample after harvest, a corn field and a soybean field, which one will have higher residual nitrate? Many times it is that corn field because it does get fertilized with nitrogen and it doesn't take up as much nitrogen as soybean does. So soybeans are great scavengers of some of that residual land in the field, but they do uptake quite a bit of nitrogen. And when does that uptake occur? About 50-50 before and after seed, seed fill, excuse me. So about half of that nitrogen be uptaken before about that R4 growth stage. So here in Michigan, we're looking probably about, you know, maybe late July, early August. And then the other 50% is after that point in time. So there is quite a bit of late season end uptake with soybean. Now, where does that end come from or where is that end derived from? Basically, there's four primary sources. One will be biological nitrogen fixation, which we'll talk about more here in a second. Residual soil end uh, that, that's in the soil could be left over from last year. And mineralization perhaps from organic matter or uh, residue that mineralizes over the course of that growing season, and then atmospheric deposition. Now, 
if you apply in early, we reduce the amount of fix then, which in the big picture of production agriculture reduces the, su the sustainability of soybean production. And that's something we wanna talk about here a little bit more this morning. So biological nitrogen fixation, what do we know? What don't we know? So we know rhizobia, right? That's that bacteria that reside in the soil. They uh, uh, form a uh, relationship uh, with soybean roots and they provide N via biological nitrogen fixation. So those rhizobia are, ho are housed in nodules. So you can look at picture on the right-hand side there. You can see nodulation of that soybean plant. Now, it's interesting to note that the enzyme responsible for N fixation requires a very low oxygen environment, all right? But rhizobia are actually a bacteria that do require oxygen. And so within that nodule, it is actually a very low oxygen environment and different rhizobia have different protein sensors that can turn on and off to help sense that oxygen concentration. And so if you look at, maybe if you cut a nodule open and at the deeper you go inside that nodule, the less amount of oxygen you have and different types of rhizobia and different uh, varieties will then have um, these different uh, uh, protein sensors to sense the quantity of oxygen that can turn on or off to better than uh, that end fixation process. Now, we fix N from the atmosphere, we turn that atmospheric N into uh, ammonium inside the plant. It does come at an energy cost. Oftentimes we forget this. To uh, uh, utilize N, uptake N via that N fixation process actually probably costs the plant anywhere between about five to 8% more energy than simply uptaking N from the soil. However, big picture, we have to consider the energy cost that goes into and fertilizer production, transport, getting it to site, et cetera. So when you do that, uh, uh, the whole picture of energy production, that uh, fixation process becomes a little bit more viable. That end fixation process usually provides about 44 to 72% of those plant end needs, so a significant portion. And when does that fixation process begin? This is always the million dollar question anywhere between emergence and V6. So even over the last two years, some of the work that we've done, we've seen that first nodule form, uh, form on that soybean plant right after emergence. And I believe uh, last year it was a little bit later, uh, or excuse me, it might've been 21 when it was drier earlier in the season. It was a little bit later. It wasn't until about V3, V4. So even that year to year variation will be a little bit variable. How does N affect the soybean plant? So that's what we've looked at here the last couple of years, looking at some different application timings, methods, et cetera. We've done a lot of work uh, with N15 testing and some ureide testing. Ureides are those uh, transport molecules that move the N from uh, that nodule and into the plant and looking at some of these stem ureide concentrations. So we've all seen pictures like this. This is straight, taken straight out of the field. Uh, from some of our work last year. You can see down on the right-hand side, we're looking at a picture of some granular two-by-two two starter. Uh, you see a little bigger canopy, a little bit more viable. On the far left side, you're looking at some liquid two-by-two two starter. You see your check plot in the middle. Um, and we've seen this, this, this bigger canopy more viable earlier in the season. And oftentimes this will result in our next picture. Looking at on the left there, you got your check plot with some starter fertilizer. We see a few more stems, a few more nodes, a few more petioles, a lot more biomass earlier in the season. And over on the right-hand side, we can see that check plot compared to that center photo has some pre-plant applied in, and then that right-hand photo has some V4 applied in. So both some in-season pre-plant and starter pictures here looking at that canopy. The big thing we need to remember is that soybeans are not corn. And what do I mean about that? Soybean nutrient uptake is it's very similar to biomass production. Soybeans in our region put biomass on throughout that growing season, and hence we get that season-long assimilation of nutrients. Now, what we have to be careful of oftentimes in something like corn production, especially with starter fertilizer and N application because it is very unresponsive, the taller that plant is earlier in the season, you build that canopy, more photosynthesis, et cetera. But I think a lot of us can look at 
uh, soybean plant height and yield potentials and think of five, maybe six foot tall soybeans that in some years have yielded quite well. And in some years have probably been in that 20 to 30 bushel range, quite low. On the, the opposite side, I think we can think of uh, times when we've looked at soybeans that might only be two to three feet tall that have yielded quite well and that have not yielded quite well. So we can't just hang everything up here on plant height equaling better yield with regards to soybean production. When we get too large of a canopy, especially uh, towards uh, end of the season, we tend to see some of these pod fill and pod set issues. We tend to see a little bit more increased water use, which that plant may not be able to support. We then run the risk also of some white mold issues and some lodging issues. But if we get too small of a canopy earlier in the season, we get ineffective light absorption and we still end up in some of those seed fill issues. And so one thing we've looked at here over the last couple of years is looking at the starter end applications with some of these pre-plant, mid-season and even reproductive end uh, applications. Big thing I wanna point out with this chart you're looking at here, you're looking at N15 testing, right? So the amount of N that's in that plant uh, that's that's fixed via fixation from the atmosphere with NTC stands for non-treated control, two by two applications, pre-plant V4 and R2N. When we look at sampling at both R2 and R6, anytime we apply pre-plant and V4N, we tend to reduce the amount of N that's fixed via fixation, which tends to be freely available. When we use our starter application, in these cases, it was 25 pounds of N. Uh, we do not reduce the amount of N that was fixed by fixation. Same thing in our non-irrigated plots uh, with those data down below. When we use that pre-plant V4N, we tended to reduce the amount of N that was fixed by fixation. Last year, same thing across the board. When we look at that V4 applied N and pre-plant applied N, by the time we hit R6, we reduced the amount of N that was in that plant via and fixation starter end, we did not necessarily see those same factors um, under our non-irrigated conditions. Again, we saw that reduction with V4 and R2N uh, in-season application, reducing the amount of N that was fixed via biological nitrogen fixation. And I should say both in the last two years, we haven't seen very many yield differences with regards to N application on soybeans here in South Central Michigan. So where does that leave us? Here's what we know. So we started some of these studies trying to figure out where's that sweet spot with N application where we don't reduce the amount of N that's fixed via fixation. Here's what we know. Starter fertilizer at 25 units of N and under has not reduced that plant's ability to fix nitrogen. So when we stay around 25 pounds of N in a starter and reduce, we do not reduce fixation. Some years we've seen a, a bit of a yield response, and some years we haven't. I'll get more into that here in a second. When we applied around 100 units of N, PPI or V4, we tended to inhibit fixation. So basically we're just reducing the amount of fixation and supplementing that with synthetic fertilizer. When we applied N at R2, we did not inhibit N fixation, but we also saw no yield benefit. So it might just be a little bit too late in that scenario uh, to see a benefit. Now our gray area ends up in this area between 25 and 100 units of N, we don't know. All right, so that's where we're gonna do a little bit more testing to try to figure out where that inflection point is, where we start to reduce uh, that amount of N that does uh, get fixed from the atmosphere. Canopy size, that canopy size may depend on that in-year climate pattern. Do we want a bigger canopy? Maybe yes, maybe no. Probably depends on the amount of water that's gonna be available to that plant. So in some years, that larger soybean plant has done well. And in many years, that larger soybean plant has not done well because it's reduced some of those pod set and pod fill issues. So we can't just rely on that end response and that plant canopy response. Take home point is let that soybean plant fix nitrogen, allow that soil to supply some of that remainder of that end, maybe some of those yield gaps via mineralization. If you wanna take a look at some of these starters, about 25 units of N and under, we know we don't inhibit fixation. Between 25 and 100, it's a little bit of a gray area. We know when we get about that 100 unit of N mark, we tend to reduce the amount of N that is fixed naturally by biological nitrogen fixation. So 
Do we need supplemental N if you have a nodulation failure? Absolutely. So nodulation failures still do occur. Where do we tend to see these? Oftentimes it's in manured fields. Uh, it's when uh, soybeans may follow forage legumes and in first year soybeans. So some of that virgin ground in those specific scenarios an R1 to R3 N, N application may still profit. And typically recommendations in those uh, 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 growth stage of soybean will be anywhere in that 50 to 80 unit of N range when you have that nodulation failure. One thing I wanna throw out there, um, gotten a lot of questions and calls on this. We have a new bulletin available at our website listed right there, so.msu.edu, looking at some of these biological products uh, that support or pur purportedly support fixation. Uh, we just wrapped up a 12 state uh, compilation looking at multiple cropping systems with yield results, looking at some of these biologicals on a multitude of field crops, specifically corn, but a few others. And we also go into some of the explanation on the mechanics, the energy requirements for end fixation. Uh, you can see that uh, picture of that bulletin listed right there and we have that listed at so.msu.edu. So I'll thank you for your time this morning. I'll stop my, sh my screen share. We'll hang on here for some questions and try to answer those during the upcoming weather report. Thank you, everyone. Kurt, thank, thank you muted. very much. That was an excellent presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, very timely topic. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to the part where we answer questions. And I see that there are some questions in the chat. Phil asked a question for Kurt. If we have better oxygen availability, does that relate to better end fixation and then ultimately to higher soybean yields? Great question, Phil. Um, so, you know, one thing we have to remember is that anything that impacts plant growth will impact nodulation, right? So if you start thinking about um, too wet, too dry, which we've seen the last couple of uh, springs, in most cases, not this year, um, too hot, too cold, not enough sun, et cetera. Anything that impacts plant growth will impact nodulation. Um, so yes, uh, because it becomes a rooting issue also. Um, so the better rooted plant you get, the more nodules you can put on. Um, but the one thing I have learned probably over the last four years, four plus years of doing nodulation is just because you have more nodules on a plant doesn't mean that plant will yield more or fix more nitrogen. Um, I think oftentimes uh, we, get, we get fooled into thinking the more nodules, the better, and that's not always the case. Uh, so again, you need an oxygenated root zone, that plant's got to grow, you need root growth, et cetera. And all of that can lead to a healthier plant and then a, uh, uh, a critical level of nodules, which can change year to year. And like I've said, we've seen differences in nodulation between a dry and wet spring the last two years, where under dry conditions, nodulation was delayed uh, for a number of weeks after planting. Uh, and emergence. And in, in more optimal moisture condition years, we've seen that first nodule pop on that plant soon after emergence. Um, so again, uh, that, that will impact overall plant health and obviously yield. Good. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Chris uh, DeFonso offers an insect update. Uh, Chris, rather than read this, I might just turn it over to you and have you um, talk about that. Yeah, so others who trap can chime in, but my trap for traps for black cutworm and armyworm are extremely low, like zeros or one. And I'm here like in the campus area. And uh, I forgot what the second part that I had written there. Do you remember? Alfalfa weevil. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's been a report or two of alfalfa weevil hatching. And there was another question in the chat about Avapel, which is yes. the repellent for cranes because cranes have feet then the entomologist gets to talk about the cranes <laughs> that's what always happens so a avapel is a very distasteful kind of product that you can uh you could treat as a liquid seed treatment or as a kind of a dry hopper box sort of treatment and uh, when the cranes pull up the corn seed it tastes terrible and then they they learn to move on so um there's been a review of avapel over the last year or two and the liquid treatment made it through because that's done by a professional seed treater. But the hopper box treatment turns out to be um, very hard to use. It, when you talk to growers that use it, some of them have described it as the worst thing they've ever handled. 
and it's a kind of poofy and it can get in, it irritates the mucous membranes. I mean, it's a repellent and it's, so it's, that has um, some, some risk to it from the applicator standpoint, because it's a grower handling it in a hopper box sort of thing. And that hasn't made it through the review. So the company has vol voluntarily pulled that dry label and um, a couple states still have a special local needs like Wisconsin. And I think they're just using up the stocks that are there, but we've heard that there aren't, there weren't dry stocks anyway, for the most part. Last year, the labors, labels were pulled. And so even if you wanted to use the dry, it's just not available. So again, the company has to do maybe a reformulation or something like that um, because it just has a lot of grower handling issues. The liquid's still available, but you know, you're planting now and it would be a challenge to get that treated. So I don't really have any solutions for you for this year if you have cranes or geese or some of these other things, but hopefully the dry will come back if they can solve that, that handling problem. Good. Thank you, Chris. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. It's been a hey, while Mike. since... I'm going to jump yes. in here. The traps in my area have also gone down, Chris, and but um, we still had some black cutworm flight. So I'm just north of Chris in the Alma Bay area. So, uh, and I really didn't have much army worm yet. And I know Eric uh, traps along that southern border there, and I, I didn't check his traps this morning. So... Hey, Chris, I'm going to chime in here too. Up in the thumb this week, we were at 10 plus in most of my black cutworm traps. Very low on army worm. Okay. So some may be out there. And if you have some weed, weed control challenges, those are the fields that once those weeds get killed and the corn's coming up, maybe just go check them for that, for that cutting. Good, good. Thank you for that insect update. Um, regarding the... Uh, um, Alfalfa weevil. I used to scout for alfalfa weevil years ago, and uh, the prime place where I would find them early is a south-facing slope on sandy soils. I, I would find them there for faster than any place else. So, um, we do have a question here from Phil again. Is would you for this is for Kurt? Would you expect all species of legumes to have uh, reduced nodulation following another legume, uh, specifically alfalfa following soybeans? I think the answer there would be how much residual N is left in the field after, right? And there's a difference between forage legumes and grain legumes also. Um, so you'd have to take that into consideration too. But, you know, I, I'm actually surprised I hear much more often, especially as we go probably south of Michigan a little bit, on how often um, like soybean on soybean is practiced and, and has done uh, effectively uh, to this point in time. So that'd be the big thing. Um, differences, you could look at rooting system, you know, so alfalfa, uh, if you're, if you're following alfalfa, obviously alfalfa has a pretty effective rooting system, um, spread throughout that root zone. Uh, so again, the, the big issue would be probably the amount of residual nitrate left in the soil after harvest. Good. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Oh, here's one that's a little bit different. It's an irrigation question. Linda, and I don't know if you're on or um, Dennis Pennington, if you're on, but when to irrigate wheat and how much if rain is less than a half inch? So Mike, um, I'm not sure if Young Suck's gonna chime in, but the removal for, if we look at the ETs for, the, for this past week has been about 1.3 inches. So I take that 1.3 inches and subtract our half inch rain we got and uh, means we need about eight tenths, three quarters of an inch, eight tenths of, uh, of uh, irrigation on that wheat. And I see most of my wheat growers that are trying for the high, high yields that have irrigation have been running this week. So uh, that's sort of where we're at here in Southwest Michigan. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Young Suck, do you have anything to add to that? All right. Um, here's another question for Kurt. Uh, would anhydrous ammonia be a good source of N for beans? So I guess the first question would be, do you need to apply N to those beans? 
right? Um, and in many cases, again, uh, an application to soybeans has not paid off. Um, now, anhydrous is much more effective. Um, so if you if if you want to apply and that end to the beans, that that perhaps would be a possibility. I can't come across any data off the top of my head of looking at anhydrous on beans. It's getting hard enough to find it on corn here in the state. Um, but it is it is uh, tends to be cost effective, tends to be efficient from an end use efficiency perspective. But again, I think one of the take home messages is and applications on soybeans is very speculative uh, at this point. Um, a lot of my soil fertility colleagues across, especially at the upper Midwest, uh, agree. It's it's just we have not seen those benefits in many cases. Now, when you go, I think, further south in the U.S., and we tend to get a little bit higher yield potentials more consistently, there uh, we do see a few more end responses on soybeans. But again, they still tend to be quite sporadic. We had some data, uh, Dan Reiser, I do some on-farm trials uh, with uh, nitrogen on soybeans and, and Dan Reiser actually had a grower down in Southwest Michigan that uh, did apply um, two rates of anhydrous, 40 pounds of actual N and 100 pounds of actual N and a zero. And, uh, and we tracked the cost, we tracked the nodulation and everything. And it kind of answers that question a little bit, Kurt, but we do need more information. But we found that the 40 pounds of N was enough to reduce the nodulation uh, in that field, in that particular field. And uh, the zero was the most profitable. Um, the 40 pounds of N is anhydrous and the 100 pounds were just not profitable whatsoever. The reason we did that trial is the grower had um, been rained out of corn one spring. He'd already put his nitrogen on and uh, and uh, planted ended up planting soybeans. He said his soybean yields were phenomenal. He said the anhydrous was the key. Um, so we wanted to test it the following year. And we I think we ruled out anhydrous as being the key, but I don't know. Yeah, um, and that's, that's one of those things, you know, and we've looked at kind of a gradient of N on soybeans for a number of years. And it, it always seems to be somewhere around that 25 unit of N mark or the 25 pound mark. Below that, we tend to be okay. Above that, we tend to just simply reduce the amount of N that's fixed. Very good, very good. Um, I see, uh, um, Marty, you've got a wheat disease update. Rather than read it, uh, would you go ahead and give that to us? Sure. Um... Just watching for any wheat diseases, uh, especially any of those that might be moving up from the south, um, such as stripe rust. And at the moment in Kansas, there's only been a few um, detections of stripe rust and their overall risk is really low. So at the moment, that's, you know, like you know, where we would be sitting too, very low risk at the moment, but I'm always just watching to the south to see what might be coming our way. And otherwise, disease chat has been really quiet. Good, good. Another question for Kurt. Uh, Eric asked this, is there any work showing that starter N at different soil temps with early planting increase yield? Great question. On corn, absolutely. Sugar beets, absolutely. Uh, some cases wheat, absolutely. Um, we've looked at that specific issue on soybeans um, the last four years or so uh, by altering our planning dates by about anywhere between about three and four weeks. Um, and the earlier we plant soybeans, some years we see this tremendous starter response. Um, but again, it ends up in many times being just the biomass response, not necessarily a yield response. And so, you know, a lot of it comes back to how that growing season is going to behave after that point in time. And that's why I threw in some of those comments about, about uh, canopy selection. And sometimes a big canopy uh, can pay off and many times it doesn't. And we, we've seen that issue quite a few times here the last few years where we get these, even on 30 inch row beans, we'll shut row early in the season, um, get this big canopy. We got five and a half, six foot tall plus beans. Um, and it just doesn't yield. We see all that energy go into biomass. We so, see it go into longer petioles. Uh, et cetera. Some of those nutrients obviously get remobilized to the seed, but we just seem to have a hard time uh, setting more seed and setting more pods. Thank you, Kurt. We got a really long question and I'm going to paraphrase. Kurt, hopefully you've read it so you won't miss anything in there. It was from Jason Roth. Um, 
But basically, Jason is saying that uh, a lot of the research shows that uh, uh, nodules tend to drop off after R5. And so maybe late season nitrogen might be most beneficial after the nodules uh, are no longer functioning, and especially in irrigated sites. And he's just wondering what your data shows for um, uh, you know, nitrogen uh, rate trials in your irrigated sites. Yep, great question. So we actually see nodulation tend to really die off after about R4. Um, it's what we've noticed here the last number of years. You know, the thing we have to remember, once you get to about R5, some say R5 and a half, a lot of the N in the plant that goes to that seed comes from the soil. Okay, the remobilization, most of that might be finished off. A lot of it comes from the soil. So it makes sense to think that maybe a, a late season N application around then uh, may have an impact. But we have to remember, when does mineralization kick in? Mineralization kicks in about mid-June. And so we have this slug of N that can mineralize late in the season, even on a two and a half, three percent organic matter soil. And that is going to uh, uh, be around around that R5, R5 and a half and later time point. And that's where a lot of the end in that plant will then naturally come from. So you could apply then, but is it necessary and is it gonna pay when it could be naturally coming from the soil? Probably not. Now, if we get into an extreme coarse textured soil scenario, that could be a little bit of a different story. If we're talking about a sand, you know, knocking on the door of 1% organic matter or less, that could be a little bit of a different story, absolutely. One of the issues we've seen with our irrigated beans the last couple of years um, has been probably too much biomass. Um, you know, so if, if I if I think about last year, we saw some fantastic starter responses. That canopy, even on 30-inch row beans, shut quite early in the season. And we had some major issues uh, with seed quality at the end of the year. Um, our test weights on a lot of our irrigated seed were under 50 last year. Uh, we just did not get much uh, sunlight beneath that canopy. And so a lot of those seed uh, seeds or pods did not finish off. So that became an issue. Um, if I think back about three years ago, uh, we had a major white mold issue on our, our irrigated beans. And so, it, you know, in general, our irrigated beans have always yielded about maybe 10 to 12, in some cases, maybe 10 to 15 bushel above our non-irrigated, uh, but has a uh, fertilizer strategy paid. In some cases, I think there was a year where we got probably a four and a half, 4.6 bushel bump from starter. And that year it did pay, but we also had some major white mold that year that really cut into the profitability. And so um, again, it's it's been hit and miss, but the to, to sum that answer up a little bit, towards the end of the season, a lot of the end in that soybean plant is going to come from the soil and the mineralization of organic sources will supply a lot of that end. Very good, Kurt. There was just one thing I forgot to ask you is um, that Jason wanted to know is, um, did you water the nitrogen in after some of your applications? Did you irrigate afterwards to kind of water the nitrogen in? Yep. So typically with our, our pre-plant in, oftentimes we did not water that in because it's earlier in the season. With our V4 and our R2 end, yes, absolutely. We water that in immediately, immediately after application. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Roland has another question for you, Kurt. Is injection of 28? Um, and actually this is into wheat. It's uh, injection of 28% nitrogen into irrigated wheat after jointing. Any research or results at MSU about maybe five gallons per acre? Uh, that's a great question. A lot of that would probably depend on when your initial N application took place. And so mm -hmm. when we start looking at these later season N applications on wheat, many years we do not see a response, but it depends on when your bulk application on that wheat went down. So if you're typically in that green up stage, that FIX4, FIX5, we haven't seen a response to late season end very often. If you're more in that freeze up stage, you might be in that FIX2.5, FIX3, uh, get on the field uh, before the soil begins to thaw, which typically is probably anywhere between, you know, about the first two weeks in March. Then we have seen some responses through that late season end application. And the reason is, 
the amount of end loss you get in between about that FIGS 3 and FIGS 5 growth stage. So I call one the freeze up and one the green up growth stage. Mm. This year, for instance, I think we saw about five and a half inches of rain in between freeze up and green up. And so you might see a response to that late season end. But again, if you're tillered going into fall, if you're tillered coming out of dormancy, saving that end more towards that FIGS 5 or that green up stage tends to be the smarter move because you limit the opportunities to lose that nitrogen. Very good. Very good, Kurt. Um, that's all of the questions that we have in the chat. Is there anyone that wants to unmute yourself and ask a question of either Kurt or Jeff at this point or any of the specialists that are on? All right. Um, I'm going to, I have just a few comments I want to mention because it ties into Kurt's comments about nitrogen on soybeans. How do you identify what does nitrogen deficiency look like in the soybean crop? And whenever I've seen it, it basically is a very pale green, um, across the board, kind of a light green, um, shorter plants with dark green islands in the field. Typically you will see normal looking plants, but most of the field will be light green. And I've seen that uh, in first year soybeans. I've seen it following manure. I've seen it because of flooding. And I've also seen it like Phil Cates mentioned after alfalfa, just the opposite of what Phil was saying. Um, after alfalfa, we've seen some nodulation failures. So those are the things to look for. And if you see that, um, definitely give me a call. Um, Prior to R2, prior to R1 would even be better. But yeah, if you see that kind of symptom, please give me a call. And Mike, I'll throw on there too. Make sure you don't confuse that N deficiency with sulfur, sulfur. deficiency, right? So Definitely. typically that sulfur deficiency will show up on that top node or two on that plant. Very good. Very good. But you're right. General yellowing, uh, light green appearance, stunted plants. Yep. Very similar. Um, all right. Uh, that's all we have for today. There's no other questions. Mike, we do have more questions that oh, came in. Do. Okay, let me scroll down. And Lyndon had a comment. Um, thanks. A lot of directional boring's been happening near farm fields, and I'm running into producers that have found damage um, to drainage lines, irrigation lines, uh, irrigation water lines, irrigation power lines. So if you have uh, directional borings been happening near your field and you have think something that could have got hit, it'd be better to know about it now than waiting until you need the irrigation or the drainage uh, hole ends up flooding the edge of the field. So take a look at those things. Okay. And I do see this question about foliar fertilization on soybeans. Uh, Kurt, I'd, I'd like you to take a stab at that. Sure. So we always get the question about foliars on soys. Um, depends what's in the foliar, right? So if you're talking micronutrient, yes, absolutely. With regards to something like manganese or zinc deficiency, we can correct those issues in season in the field with a foliar fertilizer. If you're talking about using foliars to provide a little probably N, K or P, N, K or P uh, you know, typically we haven't seen a response to that. You have to remember how much macronutrients that soybean plant takes up and it's quite a bit um, when you start talking about you know with something like potassium uh, about 1.1 1.2 pounds of k2o per bushel phosphorus about 0.8 pounds of p2o5 per bushel we just can't get that amount of p or k into the plant with a foliar application the other thing you got to think about is with that foliar application how much of that folder is staying on the plant? How much is rolling off the plant? Uh, you know, obviously carrier volume will impact that, but oftentimes you see quite a bit rolling off the leaf of that plant, ending up in the soil and you get soil uptake anyhow. Um, so the big thing would be, yes, with the micronutrients, absolutely, absolutely take a stab at it, um, especially with something like manganese, which we see a little bit more consistently here in Michigan. With the macronutrients, it's much, much less common to see a positive response. Thank you, Kurt. I'll just yeah. add to that. We've had 150 on-farm trials in the last 10 years, evaluating a bunch of different uh, foliar fertilizations on soybeans, 150. 15 of those were profitable. So 10% of the time um, we saw profitability. So it, it's it's a low probability um, uh, chance of, of response with the exception of manganese, like Kurt says, combined with foliar manganese symptoms. Okay, there is a couple more questions. Here's one on wheat. 
Kurt, for you, it's uh, initial application made in the spring green up. What should an additional N application be made or when should an additional N application be made to wheat for yield? How late is beneficial? Yep, so we've looked at this a couple times in the last few years, kind of from more of that rescue N application standpoint. Uh, whereas, you know, at some point we're going to get into one of these Michigan Springs where it's just too wet to get out. How late can we apply and still see a yield benefit? We've gone as late as probably Feeks 7 or Feeks 8 uh, with up to about 40 pounds of N and seen anywhere from about a 20 to 25 bushel bump. But the, in those scenarios, it's when N was not applied at all up to that point in time. So if you went out and applied your N at green up, Conditions since then have been been pretty pretty moderate. I mean, we've been cold. We probably haven't lost nearly as much. Make sure your green up is you know feeks four and a half to feeks five. You know, in some cases, you you might want to consider up to maybe thirty units of N applied late. Is it going to see a yield benefit? We have not necessarily seen that response. Now you got to make sure if you look at other states and production regions across the, across the U.S. The U.S. Often, oftentimes you'll see um, regions apply that from a protein perspective, uh, not necessarily from a yield perspective. So there is a difference there. But if you went out at around FIX5 um, with your bulk application, your full application, I don't see any reason up to this point in time today. We haven't seen major end loss conditions since then. You probably would be okay if you do want to consider an end application later in the season, yet up to about 30 units would probably be the max. Thank you, Kurt. We have one last question, then we'll wrap up after that. But uh, it's from Dave, and it's what about foliar fertilization in wheat? Any profitability there? My response probably would be the same thing. Um, Looking at some of the micronutrients, absolutely. Um, other macronutrients, it gets very tough that late in the season to see that positive response, unless um, we haven't got any of that nutrient on at that point in time, right? So we have to remember there's a difference between maybe a late season N application and a rescue N application. Those are completely two different scenarios. Um, but again, with some of those foliars, take a look at the manganese, zinc, Occasionally boron, we could see a, a late season response to that. With the macros, it gets a little bit more difficult. Good, good. Thank you very much for the questions and uh, the excellent presentations and thoughtful answers, Kurt. We really appreciate it. Jeff, we really appreciate your excellent presentation. Thank you for joining us. And uh, that's going to wrap up today's session.